Hey, today we're at Superside Middle Georgia bringing you our August monthly tips. I'm Heather and today I've got Jesse here with me. Good morning. I'll discuss warm season grasses. Our office hours are Monday through Friday from 7.30 to 4.30 and on Saturday during our growing season we're open from 7.30 to noon. In this video you'll see our auto mower. We offer sales and installation of those. We also offer our soil cube, level mix, fertilizer, and seed. Stop by our office to see those products and pick up what you need. I'll leave it with Jesse here now. Thank you, Heather. So warm season grasses. Our warm season grasses include Bermuda, centipede, so zoysia. Uh, you should be enjoying your lawn right now. The summer heat has it growing strong. Uh, if you've got a few bare spots, no worries. You can come pick up one of our bare spot erasers which includes turf and soil, or you can just simply pick up a single roll. Our single roll uh, covers about 10 square feet. A few things to remember and to be mindful, mindful of right now. Uh, first, August is your last month to fertilize your warm season grass. Uh, Bermudas, we wanna, we wanna go at it with a 16-4-8. Uh, zoysia, a 5-10-30. One other thing to be extremely mindful of right now is our, the army worms. Army worms, army worms, army worms. They are on the move. So uh, you can get more details on our website. That's, that would be highly recommended. Uh, next month, we'll, it'll be time to start our pre-emergence, uh, but there'll be more to come on that uh, next month. Mowing height is critical. Uh, we, you need to make sure you, you mow your warm season grass at its recommended height and mow on a regular schedule. Now I'd like to turn it over to Brandon. He's going to go over some cool season grass. Thanks, Jesse. Hey guys, thanks for tuning in today. Just want to go over a few uh, tips, uh, best practices for cool season turf grass. Although cool season turf grasses like uh, elite tall fescue don't survive here in middle Georgia, uh, it's in the mid 90s today, uh, going to be extremely hot. So for those that are that are wondering if you can grow cool season turf grasses in middle Georgia, that's a big no, no. But we do have some some great warm season turf grasses that will do great here for you. So let's move into some do's and don'ts. Uh, a lot of these you've already heard if you tuned in last month. Uh, so we'll go over the don'ts first. So we don't want to fertilize. We don't want to plant any seed. We don't want to overseed and we don't want to plant any sod. As far as fertilization goes, not the optimal time to fertilize. You've probably been hearing that for the last two months. We want to wait about another 30 to 45 days until we start doing that. And we'll definitely let you know when that time comes. Now, as far as sowing seed, putting out new seed, overseeding your lawn, or putting out any fescue sod, you want to avoid that if at all possible, if your schedule allows. I uh, really want to wait about another 30 to 45 days, and we'll also let you know uh, when it's time to do that. It's just really too hot right now, and if you're trying to put out any sod or seed, it's really going to struggle with this summer heat as we go into the dog days of summer. Let's talk about the do's. Uh, we do want to continue to mow, we want to irrigate, and we want to protect. As far as mowing height goes, as we've said before, we want to stay around three and a half to four inches. If your lawn does get away from you, if you're on vacation and you come back and your, your lawn is six, seven inches tall, as far as fescue is concerned, you want to gradually take that down. You don't want to chop it all off all at one time. So gradually take that back down to three and a half to four inches clean up any thatch and debris that you may have and prepare your lawn for when it's time to overseed in any, any bad spots that you may have in your lawn. Uh, going on to irrigation, uh, as far as irrigation is concerned, uh, we have had pretty consistent rainfall here in the south and most of your fescue lawns are probably looking pretty good this year, especially if you have, have a supplemental irrigation system. That rain could cut off at any time though. Uh, and so just be really mindful of that. Uh, have a rain gauge out there. Make sure you're getting about an inch and a half to two inches uh, to help that fescue fight off this heat for the next 30 to 45 days. And finally, let's talk about protection. So Headway G is a great fungicide that we sell and it's a systemic, it's absorbed by the plant. It gives you 30 days of, protect, of protection. It also prevents the spread of the disease. If you were to have a disease in your lawn, it's a great product to use. And another great tidbit about Headway G are the two active ingredients, azoxystrobin and propiconazole. Those are actually two products that we use here on our farm to protect our fields. Uh, a lot of folks call in all the time and they want to use the same chemicals that we use. And in most cases you can't, but in this case you actually can. So it is 
a bit pricey, some would say, if you're comparing it to what the big box stores have, but it actually is what the professionals use. So if you have a, have a fescue lawn or a cool season turf grass lawn, I would highly recommend that you come by, put out this protection to give you 30 days of protection. That's it this month for Cool Season Turf Grass. Tune in for next week where we'll give you some updates. And Hillary's going to come in now. She's going to talk about goose grass identification and eradication. Thank you, Brandon. Sure, Hillary. Hi, I'm Hillary, and I'm here to talk to you about August's weed of the month, which is, like he said, goose grass. It's also called silver crabgrass, and the scientific name is Eleusini indica. And as with all of our weeds of the month, the hint about this plant, hints about this plant, are in the names. The name Eleusini comes from the name of the Greek city called Eleusis. And I was wondering, why would a weed be named after a Greek city? Doing some research, I found out that Eleusis was the home or seat of the Greek goddess Demeter. And Demeter was the goddess of agriculture, the harvest, and cereals. Tells you something about this plant. This is related to finger millet. It's um, a poaceae plant. It's a grass plant. It is technically edible. The indica part, the Eleusini indica, means it is originally from India or Asia. Also, I've seen North Africa mentioned. And for the common names, silver crabgrass, if you look at the habit, and Donna's going to call up a picture um, of goosegrass and crabgrass side by side, you can see the silver crabgrass. You can see it looks like crabgrass in that it has the wagon wheel formation with a center point with the stems growing out of the center point. For crabgrass, those stems are generally a reddish color or green. For goosegrass, they can often be rather silvery. It doesn't show up so much in the plant in that picture, but if Donna, if you'll cut back to the plant um, holding, you can see that it is a lot silverier. You can see all that silvery sheen in it. That's the silvery crab, silvery crabgrass name. So the other name, goosegrass, there are many weeds called goosegrass, and that usually means that the weed is either eaten by geese or that there is some sort of botanical feature that resembles a goose's foot. So let's talk about how to identify identify this weed. We've already talked a little bit about one of the differences between goosegrass and crabgrass, that being even though they both, this is actually another goosegrass, even though they both grow from wagon wheel formations, they have different color stems. So let's talk a little bit further about those stems. Don, if you'll show the next picture that shows me holding it far up the stem, it's flat. Take a stem between your index finger and your thumb and you will distinctly feel how flat it is starting from the base and traveling way up the plant. Crabgrass in the, is actually that's the same picture you saw earlier without the circles. Crabgrass, the stems are round. So if you are trying to learn the differences, start feeling the stems and if it's round, it's crabgrass. Pretty soon you won't need to to touch the plant at all, you will at a glance be able to see that the stems are flat. Also, let's go back to the picture of the, the plant I'm holding here. So, back live. <laughs> another ID feature is the stem. Another feature of the stems that's different is these stems just, they either grow up straight or they kind of flop to the side, but they aren't really runners like crabgrass has runners that shoot out and then those runners root at the nodes. So this goosegrass does not have runners and it does not root at the nose. It nodes. It's just one big clump. Another ID feature is the flowers. So Don, if you'll cut back to the, the picture of the flowers, You'll see that they're really fuzzy. They're much coarser. They're the same color green though, and that, that confuses people, but they're just a, a denser, bigger flower. Um, they're technically called racemes, but people call them fingers. And to separate goosegrass from crabgrass, a feature you'll often see is, it's in that picture and in the plant I'm holding. So if you wanna cut back to the plants I'm holding, 
I'm going to try and make this visible. There's this top cluster. They all come from the same point, the fingers all from the same point. And then there's this one little one that ends up down the stem, this one lone finger. In fact, maybe now that I'm looking at, maybe that's the goose grass feature where this top part is like the web feet of the goose. And then this is the hind claw. That is just a guess. Any botanist out there, you know, just let us know in the comments. That would be really cool to learn that. And so this plant, it's August 10th now, and it is rapidly going to seed. This is a small plant I brought in from my driveway. No, I'm sorry, I misspoke from the dirt road out front of our driveway. And it's a small plant and it's rapidly going to seed. There were even smaller plants. So as the day shortens, as the light shortens, it's producing all these seeds. And I was reading that it can produce an average of 40,000 seeds per plant. That is a terrifying amount of seeds. So that's one reason why this is such a pest in agriculture and in um, domestic landscapes. This is why it's kind of a notorious plant. So let's talk a little bit more about the life cycle of this plant or the, the yeah, the life cycle of it. It's an annual. We talked about it rapidly going to seed right now. It is a tropical or subtropical plant. It loves the southeast and it is a major pest. We're going to go into some of the other reasons why it's a major pest. Um, it loves full sun so if you're, and compacted soils. Another way, if you're trying to ID it, separate it out from crabgrass. Crabgrass, I've noticed, is more tolerant of shade. This is pretty much a full sun plant and it loves compacted soils. Like I mentioned, it was growing in the dirt road outside our house. The mailman drives over it every day and it's, it's fine. This is probably one he was driving over. It grows in cracks of sidewalks. It grows in compacted sites. Like all the weeds we've discussed, it fought, discussed. It follows human activity around. It loves the disturbed soils. It loves agriculture. It's going to grow in those those tilled fields. And it's just it's just a ubiquitous weed. And it's also super hard to dig up. This clump in my hand uh, is, was pulled up by hand, but it was a tough one to pull up. And in fact, the picture, Don, if you want to cut back to one of the pictures of them side by side with, with me holding it, um, I did a little test at that moment to see how easy it was to pull up. That was in a raised bed in a garden. The crabgrass was super easy to pull up by hand, but I could not get that gra goose grass up by myself without a shovel. So normally you have to dig it up rather than just pull it up by hand. And so we're gonna talk about how to eradicate it. The next segment we usually call the eat it or treat it segment. And technically we discussed this is an edible plant. I've heard it called a famine food because it is a lot of work, but the seeds are edible. This is also a forage crop. Livestock apparently eat it as well. And there are caterpillars that host, this is a host plant that they eat the plant. It's also, I read online, different um, cultures use it as a medicinal plant, interestingly. and but it is a, a major competitor in agriculture fields and in our lawns. And so let's talk about how to get it out of our lawns because that is why we're here, is to grow the most beautiful lawn possible. So the best way to get rid of, go get rid of goose grass is pre-emergent herbicides. So you're gonna have to wind back the clock though to February or fast forward, February this winter, you want to get out your pre-emergent. It germinates after crabgrass by a few weeks, but you're gonna wanna get it down in the same window there in early February when the forsythia is blooming to really mitigate this and just keep the seeds from germinating in the first place. Another way would be to your flower bed areas to mulch them really well. We've, we talk about that every time and also Possibly you could improve the soil. You could improve your garden beds, add compost, add compost to your flower beds, to your vegetable beds. That might help mitigate it. 
but really pre-emergent herbicide is the best and we'll talk about that a little bit further. I did mention it's super hard to dig up by hand so you want to get a shovel and that's a lot of back breaking work to get rid of a plant that can produce 40,000 weeds with a shovel. Mow it mow your lawn, keep it from going to seed. We always talk about that form of prevention, mowing, keeping the weeds down. You might this time of summer be weed whacking your marginal areas to get rid of this and the, the crabgrass going, growing to seed. And just grow the most beautiful lawn possible. Fertilize it at the right time, mow it consistently. consistently. That consistent mowing will help, um, especially a lawn like zoysias, bermudas, and centipede be really dense and thick and just get those runners filling in the the bare spots or come by and get rolls of sod for us if you just have a couple bare spots we can help you with that get get the cover on that ground so the weeds don't germinate there and so the the final method we talk about is the post-emergent how to treat weeds that are there. This is a toughie. This is one of the toughest. It um, is showing Roundup resistance. So some people with, with lawns that um, there's, there's nothing else to spray it and they're willing to have a bare spot, you can't necessarily rely on just spraying it out with a glyphosate product and for it to grow back in. You're going to want to dig it out with a, with a shovel and then get that lawn growing in good again. Um, tenacity works on this, but only in centipede and tall fescue lawns. Tenacity is not labeled as safe for zoysia and Bermuda. So we're just, we're back at that cycle of what, what do you do? How do you treat it? Um, Quincept that we sell does not work to kill out this plant. For the average homeowner who does not have a landscaping license or a pesticide applicator's license, you're going to have to hire a pro. If you have not gotten down your pre-emergent, if you're not mowing, you've got an outbreak and you want it treated, you're going to have to call a landscaper who's licensed to treat it with a, with a chemical product on your lawn. So we think though we've given you some other good solutions good ideas of really how to get this under control and all is not lost um, i tell people please be patient sometimes it takes a couple of years to turn around a lawn and get it filled in and once you have fer it fertilized and really get rid of those weed populations and have that dense lawn you want anyway so with that that's a wrap for august's weed of the month and we hope you all come back next month for September's lawn tips. Thank you.